Hello, I'm Kevin Renner. I work in administration here at CBHA, and I'm also a member of the COVID-19 task force. And hello, I'm Dr. Jha uh, from CBHA, and I am the clinic li liaison for the task force against coronavirus here at CBHA. We're getting a lot of great questions, both uh, in the clinic that the providers are answering and as well on social media when people call. So we wanna take this opportunity as we have in our other videos to answer the questions that are coming up frequently. And among those for Dr. Jha, the first one is there's a lot of concern and potentially hope about spring and summer weather uh, slowing down the spread of the virus. Do we have any evidence yet from either the World Health Organization or the CDC that uh, demonstrates or suggests that warmer weather or higher humidity will actually slow the spread of the virus? That's a good question, Kevin. So the short answer is that we don't know for sure. Uh, there are a couple of scenarios that could possibly happen. If this virus behaves more like the influenza virus, then it does slow down after the winter months are over. However, if this virus behaves more like the SARS virus in 2003, that was also widespread in China as well, as well as the world, which I have actually personal experience in China when I was in quarantine myself, uh, then um, you know the virus, uh, SARS virus started, first was reported in November 2003, and we did not achieve human-to-human -human transmission pause or stop until well into the summer month in July or August. So it depends on what this virus is following in terms of its pattern. However, I would say that at this point, we should not rely on nature to help us out. I think that the most important thing at this point is human actions. Mm -hmm. People are understandably anxious about when life is going to return to normal. Are there yet any good predictive models of when things are gonna go back to what people used to consider normal up until a month ago? Yeah, so there are some good resources out there for predicting what's going to happen. Uh, they're not there to predict the future, but uh, but to teach us uh, how to act and, and what, uh, what are the consequences if we're not acting appropriately. So I'd like to introduce a website called uh, covidactnow.org. This is a prediction tool that's uh, invented and maintained by a team of data scientists and engineers endorsed by scientists such as epidemiologists in different universities. Um, this is to help us understand what our actions, uh, what, uh, what effects our actions have uh, in terms of in different states in the United States. So this map uh, on the screen right now is a map of the United States showing the kinds of actions each state is taking currently. And you can see that in um, Washington state, we are currently having the shelter in place action. And um, if you go to the next graph, uh, that is showing what our uh, state looks like right now, predicted on March 19th. So the different colored graphs or curves are um, the, they represent the number of people going to be hospitalized uh, at different times uh, under different circumstances, depending on what actions we take. And you've noticed that there is horizontal, rather flat uh, black line under at the, at the bottom. That line represents the capacity or the number of available beds in our hospitals in uh, the Washington state. So we, uh, let's go to the next graph. So as we know, prior to yesterday, March 23rd, we, are, we were told to socially distance. So this graph shows that if we, uh, social distancing, if, uh, if social distancing is the only action we take, then uh, which means that we are right now following the orange uh, curve. So by this means alone, we're only able to reach the peak of the outbreak number by the end of April. Uh, with a rather steep increase of number of people hospitalized. And you can clearly see that in that case, we are saturating our beds in the hospital because we're way above that black line. But if you go to the next uh, graph, so yesterday we know that uh, Governor Inslee uh, announced shelter in place measures, which is a strong recommendation and legal recommendation for people to stay at home unless you have essential activities you have to fulfill, or if you're in essential industries or services, such as the hospital and the clinic. 
Uh, so notice that if we are able to maintain shelter in place uh, strictly, then by the end of April, we're able to reach the highest peak of outbreaks on a rather flat curve. Uh, this curve, um, you know, is uh, almost reaching that saturation uh, of our hospital bed here in Washington, uh, but at least we are able to maintain about that level. On the other hand, if you go to the next graph, so if we proceed to a proper lockdown, which is what Wuhan, China did, and uh, it, which is also what New York City is trying to do right now, that curve, be that curve becomes a lot more flat, which means that um, we are able to reach the peak of outbreaks by the end of March, which is this month, or this month. and that's uh, a very good um, looking flat curve. And you see that we're strictly much more underneath or below that flat curve or that flat line, which is our hospital saturation curve. Some patients are asking us why they're not able to get in to see their providers right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so is CBHA turning patients away or what's the situation if a patient does want to come in and be seen by the provider? That's also a very good question, Kevin. So in order to, in order to protect you and the rest of the community, we, would, um, we are implementing a measure to separate people who can possibly be sick with coronavirus geographically in our clinic than people who come in for other essential visits, which means that you are going to enter a different area when you come in for possible coronavirus than if you otherwise. Um, our providers take turns in uh, staffing or working in these two different regions that we try to keep separate. So on the day of your visit, while we try to match you with your own provider, your provider might not be working in the same area um, where you will be visiting, in which case we are asking other providers to see you. This does not mean that your provider doesn't want to see you. Or, uh, nor does it mean that CBHA wants to turn you away. What it means is that we are using this measure to protect you and the rest of the, uh, your family and the community. So if somebody directs you to a specific region where you will be seen, please follow that direction. And Kevin, like we talked about last time, uh, we are doing very robust telehealth visits on the phone with patients. So if you do call us, uh, we can help you make up a appointment uh, via telehealth visits with a provider here at CBHA. Um, they might not be your regular primary care provider. However, they will have uh, full access to all your medical records. The recommendations that we're seeing from the CDC and the State Department of Health and other authorities all deal with primarily the same issue of transmission and mm -hmm. to distance yourself physically and socially, wash your hands regularly, those kinds of things mm -hmm. that deal with transmitting the virus from one person to another. There's much less being said about what you or I or anyone in our audience can do to enhance their own immunity so they're more resistant individually to a transmission. Can you comment on what the research has shown around what you can do to either reduce your own immunity or enhance your own immunity as an individual? Yes. So Kevin, you're right. The most important measure at this point are still those public health measures, such as distancing yourself socially from people, washing your hands, disinfecting surfaces at home, that kind of things. However, there are things we can do on a personal level to uh, maintain our good health and boost our immune system. For example, one of the most important thing is hydration. If you can keep your body hydrated, your body is more uh, likely and uh, uh, more likely and more easily recruit cells uh, in your immune system to fight infections. So please keep yourself hydrated. And uh, sleeping well is also an important aspect. If you're able to sleep, have a good night's sleep, uh, you will feel better the next day, and you're also able to function better in general. Another thing I like to emphasize is that you need to check in with your mental health not just physically, um, because we have known for decades in the medical research and medical knowledge that uh, the uh, stress has a detrimental um, response or consequence in our health. So for example, if somebody is really stressed 
uh, some of the things that can happen would be, you know, delayed wound healing, for example, also impaired response to even vaccination. Some of the chronic diseases can ex exacerbate due to high level of stress that also can make your body more vulnerable to acute infections. And so I really would like to ask everybody to check in with yourselves and take care of each other, not just physically, but also mentally. I want to mention that CBHA does offer telehealth visits with our counselors and therapists so that if that's something you would need, we'd be happy to help you if you call us. Another thing I want to emphasize is that people should not be titrating or changing or adding or reducing their medications on their own. If you do have questions about a medication change, I would like you to call us so that we can help you out with that. Great, thank you. And I think it's probably worth underscoring something you just said as it pertains to mental health, uh, and we'll be talking about it more in the next several days, but that now those mental health visits whether it's uh, with a counselor or a psychiatric nurse practitioner can be done over the telephone. And uh, so we're looking forward to sharing more with you about that. On March 11th, a group of scientists published an opinion piece in uh, which they stated the theory that non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, might make the coronavirus worse. Mm -hmm. And since then, social media has really taken off uh, advising against using these non anti-inflammatories. What's your viewpoint on that? Yeah, so that's a very good question also. Uh, Dr. Jude and I actually did go back to the original research or the original uh, opinion piece published on this issue. Uh, I'd like to point out that the original article was actually published to uh, study and wonder about um, medications that are commonly used in diabetes and hypertension or high blood pressure, not actually focusing on NSAIDs such as ibuprofen. And uh, I also like to point out that this was a opinion case or a piece, which is very valuable in research. However, these um, articles are not backed up uh, with data or experiment. There is no clinical trial or experiments on animals or human uh, stating that this is true. Uh, this is just somebody's theory. Um, so unfortunately, social media has this power to emphasize and enlarge a lot of things in research these days, especially when it comes to a disease this widespread. Um, so many hospitals are feeling the pressure to advise against uh, taking NSAIDs when somebody is hospitalized. So if you are sick enough with coronavirus and you get hospitalized, the hospital that you are admitted into might already have protocol in place to advise against or not use uh, NSAIDs. But if you are not sick with coronavirus, and this is just your uh, usage for a headache or, uh, or a common fever or things like that, it's still safe to use, and that's my personal opinion. Um, I would like to also point out that in general, we don't want to just blindly suppress one's fever and pain. There's a reason why when you have an acute infection, your body elevates its temperature, uh, AKA fever. This is because you're some, uh, to a certain degree, your immune cells actually work better at an elevated temperature. So your body is literally uh, burning off the viruses or the bacteria that you're infected with. So we don't want to just use any medication blindly, uh, including these NSAIDs. And in response to uh, so many questions out there about NSAIDs, the FDA actually issued a statement on March 19th stating that at this time, FDA is not aware of scientific evidence connecting the usage of NSAIDs like ibuprofen with worsening COVID-19 symptoms, which um, is what we just talked about. We've been getting questions, as you know, about breastfeeding mm -hmm. and whether women can still breastfeed if they are tested positive or been exposed to the coronavirus. Yeah, so in some limited studies on uh, women with coronavirus, as well as in SARS situation, uh, we have not detected uh, the virus in the breast milk. However, that does not mean that you cannot transmit the virus through breast milk, uh, just because those studies, studies are small and we don't know for sure at this point. I would like to mention that 
um, some immune molecule molecules are actually present in the breast milk, which is protective for the baby. Uh, if let's say a uh, breastfeeding mother um, is exposed to a certain infection in the environment and her body starts making these immune molecules that will be protective for her and she can pass that protection on to the baby, which is why we highly encourage breastfeeding. Uh, for example, the CDC advised that mothers should continue to breastfeed if they're infected with the flu. They have not made a recommendation in terms of coronavirus, just because we don't know for sure at this point. Um, if you are sick uh, with coronavirus and you are breastfeeding, might be a good idea to practice some um, a, a measure such as wearing a mask during breastfeeding because that close contact uh, can facilitate the transmission of coronavirus through breathing and coughing to your baby. Uh, might also be a good time to call your doctor and make a shared decision uh, with your provider. So thanks for sharing your expertise again and taking your time uh, away from clinic to uh, record this video again. And do you have any final thoughts or recommendations or anything that you really want to emphasize to those who are listening and watching this video? Yes. Thank you for listening and watching. Um, I like to emphasize that this is not just another influenza. Anybody at any age group can be affected and this disease can be deadly. So we have to take this seriously. We fully support the effort of Governor Inslee in terms of his shelter in place order. And we can all do our parts in this um, disaster. And so um, in order to flatten the curve for not just Washington State, but also Washington State, but also United States and the world, uh, please follow orders of the public health measures. Do everything you can to take care of yourself and slow the spread. Yes. Thank you for listening and watching again. See you soon.